All right, line Y1, learn test six. We're gonna take a look at synchronous motor construction. So the synchronous motor is gonna be a specialized AC type of motor that is going to be able to catch up with our synchronous field. That's gonna be that field that we got going around the outside. It's the, the electromagnetic field uh, that moves at synchronous speed. It is going to be able to go and catch up with the synchronous speed uh, field and then it's gonna be able to go and lock in. So it rotates at the exact same speed as our synchronous field. And this is really, really important in a lot of industries where we are going to go and have balanced types of loads that we need to go and maintain a specific uh, speed off of. You know, whether that's gonna be for belt speed, whether that's going to be for vibration issues, there's all sorts of instances where we want to go and have a motor that does not change at all in its speed. We've talked about, you know, the necessity of finding variable speed motors before. Now we're gonna talk about the necessity of finding a motor that no matter what we place on it for load, whether it goes higher or lower, that it's going to maintain the exact same speed. And that's gonna be this one over here, that's gonna be the synchronous motor, where we are going to go and have a synchronous rotor that is going to be able to catch up and it's going to lock in steps that these two are going to basically be tied together. It is going to mean that we are going to have to feed in some external voltage into our motor because ultimately we know that if we would have in a normal motor, if our rotor would catch up to our synchronous field, so our synchronous field over here is moving at 1800, let's say, actually let's drop that because most of our synchronous uh, motors are going to be much lower speed. Let's say we got a rotor operating over here at 900 and if I got this uh, rotor to operate at the same 900 RPM that I'm going to have on my synchronous field and on my rotor, what we would have at that point is we would have no uh, generated value voltage that we would go and have inside of this rotor, right? We can look at it two different ways. EG is equal to BLV. That's gonna be flux density, length, and velocity. There would be no relative velocity, right? So if this guy's moving at 900 RPM and this guy's moving at 900 RPM, neither of these is lapping each other. So there's no relative difference between them. Or if you wanted to go and look at it as being EG is going to be equal to K phi, N, you would see that we would not be generating anything inside of this rotor. Remember, this rotor has to act like a transformer. We would once again need to go and see a change or a difference in speed that we would have, right? If we've got the same RPM on our synchronous field and on our rotor, we would not be able to go and develop any sort of voltage. Why is it important to go and develop voltage? Well, because we know that T is equal to K I I rotor and then my cosine of my rotor. Uh, power factor there. What this is, is this tells us that there has to be rotor current and rotor current is only going to get developed if I'm going to go and have generated voltage on my rotor. So what we see is that for a regular synchronous, uh, for a regular motor, if we brought the regular motor all the way up to synchronous speed and matched it, we would not generate any value voltage. If we don't generate any value voltage, we would not generate any value of current. And if we generate no value of current, we would not have any sort of torque. So what we're going to do is we're going to go and bypass this whole generation thing and we're going to go and get ourselves some rotor current but we're going to do that artificially we're going to go and inject dc once we get this thing up to speed we're going to inject some dc into the rotor which is going to allow us to go and maintain torque and it's going to allow us also to go and permanently magnetize in certain directions which allows us to lock in we'll cover all of that when we get into the operation but that's the point of these synchronous motors and what's going to be happening inside of them. So let's go and talk a little bit about their construction now. First thing that we're gonna go and talk about is the stator. The stator is going to be a standard three-phase stator, meaning that it can be single voltage, it can be dual voltage, it can be connected in either Y or it can be connected in delta. The purpose of the stator is the same as for any other three-phase motor. It is solely to generate a rotating uh, magnetic field. Okay, so let's not worry about that. Connections would be done the same as what we saw in like our second or third learning task inside of uh, Y1 here, where we looked at doing connections. It's just standard three phase connections for it. It's the rotor that is going to go and be the specialized thing. And the rotor is going to go and have uh, regular squirrel cage components, as well as it is going to go and have DC components. First of all, the rotor is going to be a specialized build in that it is going to be salient poles. And salient poles just means sticking out. 
The reason that we go with salient poles is we are going to want to make our magnetic lines of flux stronger. If I take a look at my stator, uh, my stator going around there, I'm going to want to have strongest magnetic lines of flux directly on these pole faces. I don't want those to distribute out in between the poles because it's going to weaken my synchronous action that we're going to talk about later on. So we go with these salient poles. You should remember from learning about alternators and generation that uh, when we are dealing with a salient type of rotor, it is going to be something that is relatively low speed. Okay, These are a relatively low speed type of motor. You can gear them up. That's fine. Uh, or, or you could go and gear them down, whatever, but they're going to be a relatively low speed. We're not trying to catch up to a 3600 RPM synchronous field. That's just going to be too difficult. We're going to bring this thing down into a much more usable range, you know, the 1800 to 900 to 1200 range, something like that. So it's going to be, because it's lower operation, we can go with this more wheel type of shaped rotor. And they are going to be very much wheel type of shape, where they're going to be fairly uh, tall, but fairly narrow. And so you will see them as just being these huge circular discs that have got these salient poles. If you take a look over here, I see that I have got a DC coil. So I've got this winding that goes around one, then around the decks, around, etc., back and forth. And what you can do is you can just figure out your direction of current. If this is my negative, current flows in on my negative and out on my positive. It would go around and then it would go around this one in the opposite and then continues the same all the way through. Do your left hand rule for coils. Your thumb should be pointing out here, telling you you got a north over here. On this one, your thumb should be pointing down here, which tells you you got a north over here. So what we are going to have is we are going to go and have these massive lines of flux when we energize the DC winding that are going to go and flow from my norths out into my souths and then back through. And so we're going to get these kind of avocado shaped type of fields that are going to be generated on each one of these. And the field is going to be strongest right at the very center over top of that pole because we're going to once again be salient and be sitting close to our stator. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm going to take a sip of coffee here. I'm just <coughs> choking on my own word. Okay, that describes the DC component of this. Now, we do have to also have an AC component. We are still going to go and have standard squirrel cage uh, design that is going to be built into this as well because the DC is going to be used when we are going to be at, uh, you know, to take us the last little bit into our full synchronous speed. But up until then, we do need to go and have a standard squirrel cage that is going to be built as part of this. So I'm going to have bars that are going to be cut through here that are going to be short circuited around the outside. All of those are going to be used uh, to go and bring us up close to synchronous speed. This is going to be called the amortisseur or the dampening type of winding uh, inside of here. The amortisseur winding is just designed to go and help us accelerate. Once we get all the way up to full synchronous speed, remember that I'm going to have the rotor moving at the same speed as my field that is going to be going around it, which means that there would be no voltage generated into that amortisseur winding. So it's only going to be there for a little bit, which means that we can kind of undersize it. They're not designed to go and carry full uh, motor current the whole time. They're not designed to be what we're operating off of. We're designed to be operating these motors off of these DC windings. Last point I want to go and make about the rotor itself is that the rotor is going to go and have to have the same number of field poles as my stator. I'm going to have to be perfectly matched. If I don't have the exact same number of norths, one, two, three, four, five, over here, on my stator as what I have got on this rotor, this thing is not going to go and work. I have to have the exact same number of norths and the exact same number of souths that are going to be on there. If you take a look at this one here, uh, it should strike you as being, you know, somewhat... Um, Odd that this thing has got a five and a five. We can create five and five because I can just go and have, remember my uh, fields, if I have got A, B, C on my, my outside over here. It's a question that sometimes I get where people say, well, shouldn't there be an even divisible number by three over there? Remember that if I have got a A, B, C, and if I go and put these things all in the right wraps on the winding, this is all, you know, motor winding theory, we're not going to go into it. But what I can have is I can have that this B phase, when it is at its absolute positive, these two would be at a negative, but I can just have their wraps going in different directions, you know, the wraps for these ones in opposite directions to the wraps for this one that I'm going to go and have over here. And when I go and do that, just curl your fingers around, you know, these coils here in the direction, you would see that this one is going to go and have a north over here, you would see that for these ones over here, I'm going to go and have, oops, sorry, I should stick that the opposite way. Uh, I'm going to go and make sure that my current going through these 
is going through in the same direction. So my ramps are going to be opposite off of here, but then splice into a Y, come back at the other, so that I can have Norths at the same time off of these, but this one is going to be the strongest North. These are going to be my, oops, not Souths, my weaker little Norths that I'm going to go and have over here. So we do create, we use all three at the same time to create a single North. So I'm basically going to do this grouping of three 20 times around on the outside of this machine, which would then go and give me all of these, you know, Norths that are going to be strong together, then Souths that are going to be strong together, etc. All right, let's talk about the uh, slip rings and brushes. We do need to have a way to go and carry this DC into this rotor. Remember, we've got the AC, the amortisseur winding, we've got the DC winding. We need to be able to carry that DC in. The best way to carry the DC in is usually going to be slip rings and brushes because uh, it's going to be a unidirectional thing. You don't need to have a commutator. Commutator is a rotating switch. A slip ring is a rotating point of contact, but it maintains contact. We are going to go and take these two. We're going to just place them onto individual slip rings that are going to be onto the shaft there. And then we're going to go and mark these things as being F1s and F2s. Tubes. Uh, this just tells me that this is going to be a DC field that I'm going to be placing on here. Current flows through. The convention is to go through from 2 to 1. So we are going to go and follow that convention mostly in what we're doing. We do need to go and push this DC in. So we're going to have to do that from the slip rings. We're going to have to go to brushes that are going to be mounted external on the machine. We'll look at that in a minute. How do we go and feed into these uh, slip rings and brushes? Well, we have got this for actual motor. Now, first of all, I want to go and uh, specify this is an incomplete drawing that we have over here. We are showing the stator, which is a standard three-phase connection over here. We are showing the rotor DC field over here, but what we're not also showing is the rotor winding, the amortisseur. I'm just going to put it in as being, I know it looks like a piece symbol over here, but as a Y that has its leads short circuit. Remember that there is going to be that AC1 that is going to be induced uh, for voltage that's going to get us up to speed. So when we turn this motor on, we are going to go and flux out these windings. We get that rotating field. The rotating field is going to cut across to our mortise here, which is going to go and start our rotation. Once we get our rotation pretty much up to speed, and we'll cover the theory later, uh, then we are going to kick in our DC at that point, which would then lock us into step. So there is just a missing component on all of these, which is going to be that amortisseur winding. Amortisseur winding. Excellent. So that's our amortisseur winding shown inside there. These over here are going to go and have their contact just done through that slip rings and brushes that we see over here. So we'll just draw this one and we will go and draw this one over here. So we've got slip rings and brushes that are riding on the outside. I'll just move that one over a little bit. Okay. That's going to be our point of contact coming into this rotor over here. If we have a synchronous motor with an external converter, what we would be doing is we would be taking DC that's already available at my site and I would be feeding that DC in. Uh, so I would have a switch over here, so our contact or something that's going to apply the DC. I'm going to go and have a reset as well so I can vary the strength of the DC that I'm going to go and have going through this thing. Uh, if you take a look, you see that we've got a negative over here. Negative is connected to 2 because we want our current running through from 2 to 1 inside of these windings over here. This will be when we've got external DC already available on site. Uh, unless it's a large industrial system, chances are you won't have that DC available on site. So then you're going to have to go to having a built-in exciter, which would be the most common way. Built-in exciter is going to go and be where I have got, once again, my stator windings as standard three-phase windings. My amortisseur, which is just built in, is that one that brings me up to speed. And then I'm going to have my rotor DC windings. And then what I will do is I will go and shaft couple my synchronous motor. So as it starts coming up to speed, it is going to be shaft coupled to this, which is going to be my DC generator. We talked about DC generators at the very beginning of the motors and generators. This over here is going to be my shunt field. So I'm going to have Fs over here. This is going to be my series field. I see that this is a DC compound machine that I have. So that I'm going to go and have, you know, the uh, compounding effects of that, the fact that I'm going to have a rising voltage coming off my series as with load, while I'm getting a falling voltage from this and the counteracts, we get a relatively flat compounded type of motor. 
I do see that I have got a field rheostat that is going to be brought out of the DC gen set, so I can adjust the amount of field flux off the DC gen set. This is going to be a self-excited DC gen set, and I'm going to go and run that DC gen set. From there, it is going to go and give me two leads out. Those two leads out are still going to have to run off of those slip rings and brushes into my actual machine. We will see that uh, in a second on a drawing. Actually, no, we'll just jump over that one right now. Let's take a look at a picture of an actual synchronous motor. Over here, we've got a synchronous motor. Uh, this one is one at a site where my brother works. It is used on a gyratory crusher. So it's got a gyroscope. It's going to be something where it has to go and maintain a specific amount of speed. What we're seeing is we're seeing that this is a massive donut shaped machine. My actual rotor is happening inside of here and it's going to be salient pole tight, low speed that we are going to go and have off of these. I'm going to go and have as well connected onto there this setup over here, which is going to go and be a alternator where I'm going to be able our DC generator that I'm going to feed in. Now I've got a little bit of, you can see the small tech cable that's feeding into here. That small tech cable over there is being utilized to go and get rectified into DC. I then take that DC and I'm going to go and feed that DC into this gen set over here. Uh, when I go and feed that thing into that, uh, that gen set, it is going to go and get passed through uh, so that we, we can go and excite our fields. It's an externally excited DC that you're seeing on the picture that we have over here. This is going to go and get put into here where we are then going to go run the DC gen set. That's what we're seeing over here. And then the DC gen set, it has a couple of leads that come out of it that are going to go over to my slip rings and brushes. Over here is a kind of crookedy looking picture, but it shows my slip rings, which are going to be these massive, massive rings right over here going all the way around, insulate it from the shaft. They're going to have a brass contact strip on top of it. And then they've got a set of brushes that are going to feed up top there. This is my DC lead that is going to be feeding into this brush set over here. Same with this one over here. We are going to go and have that other slip ring. So one of these is going to be my positive. I don't know which is which. The other one is going to go and be my negative. And then these slip rings are then going to be carrying it through into the rotor, which you can just kind of see in the background over here. It's where we have got a built-in exciter, but it is a built-in exciter that does have a multiple points of contact off of this one over here. Uh, when we take a look at it, we see that there are going to be four points of main contact and maintenance that we are going to have to have for this one. Uh, the first point is going to go and be these on the DC gen set. We're going to go and have to maintain the brushes and commutators on there, as well as, oops, sorry, I did erase those. I should have left those in, as well as we are going to have to go and maintain all of my slip rings and brushes that I'm going to go and have on the main one. So it's going to be the type of machine where you do have to have, you know, regular maintenance, cleaning, uh, reseeding of brushes, all of that type of stuff that's going to go and happen. Last one that we have is going to be a brushless exciter. And the brushless exciter does not have any brushes. So all that little bits of maintenance we talked about right uh, before with the commutator and brushes and with the slip rings and brushes, these components over here, we don't have that on the brushless exciter. Brushless exciter is only going to go and take single phase AC in. We are going to rectify that single phase AC and we are going to go and build some permanent DC on our stator inside of my DC gen set. This is gonna be a, our, a DC gen set. This is an AC one, but we're just gonna build some fields. Those fields don't need to go and rotate. They're just gonna be built onto the stator itself. Then what I'm going to have is I'm going to have a rotor inside of there that is gonna rotate inside of those fields, right? We have EG is equal to BLV or K phi N, whichever one you prefer to go and utilize to look at this. We have got flux density, we've got length off of the rotors, we're gonna have velocity. The velocity is gonna be provided by the fact that I'm going to go and couple this brushless exciter. It's gonna be on the same shaft as my actual rotor. So I'm going to go and have the synchronous motor rotor that is going to go and start spinning up this brushless exciter. It is going to then start to generate three phase AC that I'm going to go and have off here. That three phase AC that gets taken through a three phase bridge rectifier and then gets fed directly into the rotor itself. This all happens along the shaft itself. So if I were to look at this thing, uh, let me just see if I can kind of draw it out over here. I'm going to go and have my synchronous motor rotor on that synchronous motor rotor, I'm then going to go and have a long shaft. I'm going to draw the shaft here fairly thick right now. And then I'm going to go and have these windings over here, which is going to be my exciter rotor. 
over here, which is going to be composed of those, those three sets of windings that are then all going to be circulating inside of this field that we are going to go and have. We'll just call this thing the, the field right over here. And then what I have is, because I've got these three windings, that this section right over here, I'm just going to go mill a slot on this shaft over here. Uh, and that slash slot is going to get milled, so I'm going to go and take the three phase directly off of here. I'm going to go and have a rectifier pack that is going to go and get bolted onto that shaft. It should be balanced around this thing, or in some cases it's going to be built onto the end of this. Then from there, so now I've got three phase AC that's coming in from here. We'll generate off that. It converts then into DC, and then that DC goes out and we feed that into my actual rotor over here there's no brushes whatsoever now you can't maintain anything you can't check up on the bridge rectifiers or stuff like that unless you actually shut this motor down because they are all whipping around at speed uh, but ultimately i can control the amount of dc fed into here by controlling this field if i take the field current down that is going to go and decrease my flux right flux is equal to or by Flux will just go with this. Phi is equal to my ampere turns. So as long as I drop my current, I'm going to go and drop my flux. If I drop my flux, I'm going to go and drop the amount of voltage that I'm going to generate off of that, which is then going to drop the amount of voltage that I'm going to have converted into DC and be feeding back into that rotor. Overall, we see that we're going to have a less strong voltage, which means I'm going to have a less strong current over here on my DC rotor component. These ones are great for the fact that you're not going to have to do a lot of maintenance on them, uh, but they don't, uh, or they, they can be a little bit more expensive to go and buy. In a lot of cases, the older ones, because this was a uh, type of machine that we saw more in old configurations, although there is still a bunch of these that are operational, uh, we used to use the DC Gen set more than we would use this brushless exciter. For the rest of the construction of the motor, you're just going to have end bells and bearings. Uh, end bells and bearings on these things, in a lot of cases, are going to be fairly open. If you take a look at this one over here, you see that this thing is open so that we can get in to go and maintain the brushes and the slip rings that we have over here because there are main points of maintenance that we are going to go and need. You also see this cap over here. Uh, this is going to be where we would go and put lubrication oil into this so that we can maintain these. All of that stuff just needs to be accessible to an extent as long as you have got components. Some cases they will seal them off and they'll just have removable hatches that you can go and open up, etc. But ultimately the whole end bells and bearings provide support, centering, and they should allow us access into any user serviceable parts.